and welcome to New York City Atheists Live on Tape, brought to you by New York City Atheists Incorporated. I'm your host, Dennis Horvitz, the David Letterman of the Hopelessly Damned. Our guest today is Sean Fairclough, the new executive director of the Secular Coalition for America. In June, Mr. Faircloth uh, joined the Secular Coalition, an alliance of nine atheist organizations, including New York City Atheists, for the purpose of representing uh, secularist groups to Congress. And his mission includes changing public awareness and perception of non-believers, uh, getting atheists to stop being couch potatoes. I'd like to see that happen. <laughs> uh, and also something he calls the privileging religion in a way that harms real people. An example would be uh, the George Bush uh, faith-based uh, faith based initiatives uh, that where federal money is funded to these uh, many organizations, including church organizations. And uh, the, the, these church organizations are often not uh, subject to the same uh, laws that, that secular groups uh, dealing with the same uh, needs would, would, be, would have. Um, and prior to this, he was uh, elected uh, an elect re representative to the Maine State Legislature for 10 years. And in, in 2006, he was appointed uh, Majority Whip. So uh, before you run off to 10 your lobster pots, uh, join us with some speech making and hopefully a little down east humor with uh, Sean Faircloth. Thank you. I, I promised him I wasn't going to do it. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you, Dennis, and uh, thank you, Jane. I wanted to thank Ken, all three of you. Just, uh, it's a tremendous turnout for this event, and uh, it really is a tribute to them. You know, Ken was talking about the number of people. I think it was three who showed up at one of the first meetings he attended. And look at this meeting. So a round of applause to Ken, to Jane. And but you're a leader for the entire United States, and I want to thank you for that because I can point to you folks and say, let's, let's follow that model. It really is very valuable for all of our country. So thank you. I also just wanted to thank, uh, uh, I don't know if he's still here, Jose and Christina, right? Wanted to thank you for your help. Thank, there's a lot of work to help everybody here. And maybe I should ask Christina, did, I understand, are people still chilly in back? Are you okay out there? All right, they're good. Thank you, Christina. So we'll make sure it's okay. And you can hear me okay back. All right, good deal, good. I want to make sure you're uh, comfortable because I'm only speaking for four hours. So I don't, you know, I'm trying to. I've tried to limit the speech to something you know that's. This is the rest. But uh, so for me, yeah, I am the executive director of Secular Coalition for America. I served ten years in the Maine legislature. You know, isolated up in the snows. You know, we don't have all the celebrities that you have here in New York, except for Stephen King. We have him, you know, in Bangor. But other than that. Uh, you know, I haven't lived in a city since I was in law school, so this experience of being the executive director of Secular Coalition in Washington is a big learning experience for me. I, I learn a lot and I travel around the entire United States quite a bit, and I gotta tell you, there's stuff that I never knew about uh, before. Uh, one, for example, I recently uh, went to Louisiana, and that was a learning uh, experience for sure, trust me. You know, you think the big easy, you know, life's kind of wild, a little bit on the edge. Well, I tell you, how they run public policy there is a little bit uh, different. You know, we in Maine, uh, across town from where I was from in Bangor, we had Stephen King, and people would say he's scary because he would write about demons. But in Louisiana, the governor actually says he specifically believes in demons in the state of Louisiana. <laughs> governor Jindal. I am not making this up, Governor Jindal. Senator Vitter from Louisiana, he's another experience. You might remember him. He's the one who will lecture you about your sex life while he's got the whores at the Mayflower Hotel around the corner from my office. But I, to me, your sex life, that's not my business. I, I feel like we should stay out of that. But one thing that did really strike me about Senator Vitter, and I'm not making this one up either, is he said, the senator from Louisiana said that opposing gay marriage opposing gay marriage was so important, so important, that it would be more important uh, than if Katrina and Rita were to get together. It's that important. And I'm thinking, geez, Louisiana, I thought that Katrina was sort of a problem down there in Louisiana from what I, you know, I understood. And then I thought Katrina and Rita, both females, getting together, who knows, you know, they should be concerned. Uh, Senator Vitter should be very concerned about that. And then another place, another learning experience was I went to Iowa, and they had a bus sign, as some of you may have heard, in, in Des Moines, Iowa, 
uh, about non-believers there. And they asked the governor of Iowa whether non-believers had the same First Amendment rights as other Americans. And this guy, who was a Democrat, by the way, said, geez, I don't know. I'll have to get back to you <laughs> later. Thanks. That, that was good to know. I was just down in Florida before I came here. And actually, this member of Congress who came from New York, but she's from Albany, so maybe that doesn't count to you New York City people. But anyway, they have a member of Congress. Originally, she was from, from that region of, of New York. And she went, she went to go witness an execution. Kind of scared. Went to go witness an execution. When the guy was executed, there was blood that came down. I don't know from nose, but she said that the uh, blood formed a cross on the end, that the cross clearly meant that God favored the death penalty. She said this. <laughs> you know, here's where you feel you really are having a learning experience where this is a member of the United States Congress who, who in fact says this kind of thing. And even for us in the state of Maine, um, in November, you know, I learned something because 10 years in politics, um, you know, you learn something about demographics. And I was hopeful that we would be a state that would support uh, equal citizens for, for gay Americans, but we didn't get there. Now, a lot of that had to do with money from other places invested in our little state. But nonetheless, uh, it was an unfortunate lesson for me that we have a long way to go in taking theology and uh, theocratic control out of our government. And so I'm really honored to have this job as Executive Director of Secular Coalition for America because it's only been about four years that you in this room have had your lobbyist in Washington, D.C. And it's, it's unprecedented. Uh, only this year, for the first time in the history of the United States, we have a president in the White House who is at least willing to open the door and have conversations with and about non-theistic Americans. He mentioned us in uh, the inaugural. He mentioned us in his speech in Cairo. And we do owe him uh, gratitude uh, for that and are very appreciative of it. But there's a long way to go, and I want to begin discussing how far we have to go by uh, talking to you about the Bible, because I know nothing about it. <laughs> I really, I'll go to these conferences now with this job, right? And you go to these conferences where there'll be these experts on the scripture and the contradictions between different parts of the Bible, and there's experts on, on uh, the whole theory of evolution. I'm not much of an expert on anything. I'm a lawyer. I'm a politician. But yet, uh, I do want to start with the Bible because... For me, uh, an important point in my life, I was about 11 or 12 years old, and uh, I, even though I was in politics in, in Maine, I grew up in Southern California, so when you go on the family vacation, you're driving across the desert. That's kind of biblical, you know, you go a big cross-country <laughs> trip, and I'm there with my sister, and we're fighting about who's on what side of the line, the backseat of the car. So one of those trips I said to myself, you know, about 12 or so, I'm going to read that Bible. And of course, the Bible, some of you may know it, it was the one that has the fake uh, leathery uh, binding and it has the purple and red letters, the children's Bible, and I'm reading through it. And I get to the part where it, it, it has God instructing Abraham to kill his son, right? Yeah. And, you know, I'm sitting in the backseat of my car, my dad's driving, and, I'm, and they're saying in the Bible, this is a good thing. It shows his faith, his God-fearing nature that Abraham would have. And I'm thinking, I'm hoping my dad's not too God-fearing here. I didn't understand. <laughs> is this a good thing? You know, I'm... Dude. So, but it really was the first moment in my life where it gave me that moment, that moment of pause, where I asked myself some questions. One, would a moral person obey an instruction from a god to kill their child? Would that be moral, whether it came from God or anybody else? And secondly, would a god be moral if they were to instruct someone, even as a test, in case you're a biblical scholar, even as a test, to kill their child? Would that be a moral thing to do? And then a third question was that I was under the impression then, and, and in my career uh, in elective office, I worked a lot on children's issues, so I'm under the impression now that children are actually human beings. And that to treat them as some form of chattel, some form of property that you could sacrifice in a religious ceremony struck me as as passing strange, as a bizarre conception of how human beings should interact with each other. So it was a moment of pause for me. But contrast that story, and that's a legend, a story, with something real uh, that happened in the United States of America in this century. Uh, there was a little girl, and her name was Amia White. And little Amia uh, was two years old, and like most kids who were two years old, uh, she went to childcare. 
and they lost track of her in the child care and she was left alone in a van in Alabama in the sun in the summertime and after about two hours little Lemieux's heart gave out and she died alone in that van and on the outside of the van were painted the words holy church and that is so because in Alabama they have two sets of laws one set of laws for secular child cares and an exemption for all religious child cares so for food safety regulation they have laws that apply to secular child cares but not to the religious child cares medication regulation medication segregation no nope. doesn't apply to religious child cares applies to the secular child cares staff training child staff ratios applies to the secular child care religious child cares completely exempt from those laws in fact you can't even find out what's happening because the secular child cares have unannounced state inspections the religious child cares are exempt from inspection period nobody goes and looks at them from any state health department of any any sort now you don't need to worry you don't need to worry at all because the president of the Alabama Christian Coalition said that the pastors in the congregations are our quality control at these child cares so no worries but to, but to be fair maybe that's that one death of Amia White maybe her death was an anomaly a fluke but there was a boy named Demiron Lindley Demiron was three years old and he was left alone in a van in the sun in a child care in Alabama for 10 hours and then he died at a religious child care facility in the United States in the 21st century. Now I said Alabama but these are your New York tax dollars at work. About one-fifth of the children at these child cares receive the federal low-income subsidy so it is your tax dollars that go to a child care in Alabama that in turn doesn't even have to obey the Alabama child care health and safety regulations so you are helping to pay for that situation in the United States of America in Maine which is not a fundamentalist dominated state but even in Maine there are laws and statutes which say for example that I'm a parent and I say I don't believe in, in vaccinations and therefore I'll say I don't want to give them to my child and if you say and only if you say it's for religious reasons they can be exempt if their child's going to a small child care and that would endanger that child it would endanger the child with whom they come in contact and it could endanger the larger community and it's an exemption specifically because and only for those who assert a religious belief connected with that denial of vaccinations that's the kind of world we are in I also want you to consider another ancient story unlike the Abraham story uh, this story is true it's from about four or five hundred years ago with the pre-Columbian Incas in Incan culture they had a ceremony where they would take children up to the mountains uh, they would drug them first they would inebriate them first and then they would kill them as a sacrifice uh, to their gods. That's what they did in the Incan culture, but this is about 500 years ago. Contrast that with what happened in the 21st century in the United States of America in the state of Tennessee. There's a girl named Jessica Crank, and Jessica's about 15, when she developed a tumor on her shoulder. And it was a tumor that could be easily treated with modern medical science, and the tumor grew and grew because mom didn't believe in modern medical science mom pointed to the epistle of James for the treatment of her 15 year old daughter and the continuation of this tumor growth led to a point where the tumor was not figuratively but literally the size of a basketball on this girl's shoulder she was in agonizing pain and then she died in the 21st century in the United States of America. Why? Why did this happen? Well, part of the situation for why this happens is politicians, because politicians care more about the pressure that they receive from religious lobbying than they do about the life of the Jessica Cranks of the world, and more than they do about modern medical science. They are pressured by lobbying groups, and politicians react 
to that kind of pressure. And I can look at your faces, we're here in New York City, and you're thinking, well, Alabama, Tennessee, <laughs> come on. Over 30 states, over 30 states have exemptions in their law for this so-called faith healing. That's what it's called, by the way, faith healing exemption. But of course, I'd be for it if it were faith healing. It is faith killing. In fact, it's faith torture and then faith killing. I bet you there's people in this room, and I commend you, who spoke out against torture in Abu Ghraib. You said, that's wrong. America should never be involved with that. And they shouldn't. We shouldn't waterboard anybody. We shouldn't torture anybody. Even if they're a terrorist, I say we shouldn't torture them. But if you're a 15-year-old girl who did nothing whatsoever, should you go through months of agonizing, horrible torture in the United States of America and then be killed? Well, that's what happens in the United States of America today. And there are laws in over 30 states that allow the pastors, not, not theoretically, not abstractly, but correctly, it allows the pastors to point to those laws and say, listen, the, the legislature gave us an imprimatur for our activity. The federal government, signed by Bill Clinton, by the way, in 1996 in the Child Abuse uh, 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 Prevention and Treatment Act, provided an exemption. Otherwise, there's a minimum standard that applies to all, applies to everyone, applies to everyone in this room. But if you say faith healing, oh, well, then there's an exemption. And this is more commonplace than you might think. They did a pediatric medical study of children in the faith assembly congregation. Some of you may be familiar with this faith healing with regard to Christian scientists, but there are a number of other denominations that practice uh, the so-called faith healing. In the faith assembly denomination, they studied the little ones. We're talking about children zero to six months old. The infant mortality rate among these children was 270% higher than that in the general population. In, in Massachusetts, they have a sect where you don't even know about it, because a lot of these kids are homeschooled, and when they're little, you never hear about it, and, and situations where a lot more kids die that we don't, we don't even know about. But they have the ceremony in Massachusetts where they think that Katahdin up in Maine is some kind of holy ground. They cart the kids while they're little and dead and bury them up in Mount Katahdin area in Baxter State Park in Maine. And we are only seeing the tip of the iceberg with the, the cases of teens and others that somehow get into the press and get into the media. There's a lot more of this going on, and we need to speak out. But I also got to ask myself the question, uh, Representative Stupak from Michigan, we've, some of us are familiar with him now about the issue of abortion, right to life, he says, all right, fair enough, right to life. Where are the right to life folks for Jessica Crank? Where are they for Amia White? Where are they speaking out? I, actually, I'm working under the theory that people who are born have a right to life, yeah. that they have a right to human existence. Who is speaking out for them? But you know, we should be speaking out for them. We in this room should not let up. And we should not forget about this issue. And I mean even in 50 states, even if it's not here in New York, we have a moral obligation to speak out for children in every part of the country that are subject to this religiously based child abuse. And that's exactly what it is. Let me give you a third form of religiously based child abuse that some of you are more commonly familiar with. And I would illustrate with uh, Father Paul Shanley from New England, who some of you maybe uh, have heard of. Father Shanley attended the Man-Boy Love Association meetings. Hey. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that uh, that's a bad thing. That's, that's my <laughs> view. That's just me talking, but that's my view. But, you know, I went to the University of Notre Dame. I went to school in Ireland. I have friends who are priests. I don't think it's fair to say, you know, all priests are pedophiles or go into that kind of stereotyping. But what I do think is institutional, institutional, that it is fair to criticize is this. Bishop Daly, Father Shanley's boss, knew, knew that his employee was attending the Man-Boy Love Association meetings when he shifted him from Parish A to Parish B to Parish C. Think about that situation. Think about the morality of that kind of situation and the lack of warning to parents, and that that's only one example, one of the more famous, but one of many, many examples of that situation. It gets worse in my view. Because the lawyers for the Catholic Church assert, they say it is their First Amendment right under the Free Expression Clause to keep secret their internal employee decisions of switching employees and how they manage employees who are accused of pedophilia. I started a children's museum up in the state of Maine. We had employees. If we were to ever be sued, luckily nothing ever happened, but if we were to ever be sued, our employees were in contact with children and somebody sued us, 
my response would of course be we give all information we should, as of course we should, about any, any concerns that people might have when someone has contact with children. But that's not what the Catholic Church says. They say we get to keep secret uh, our decisions. We're different. Although it's sort of a looking glass to walk through that uh, keeping something secret is part of your free expression clause right. But they assert that view aggressively in many litigations throughout the entire United States and they delay cases significantly as a result of that legal strategy. And for me it's hard. It's very hard. I, I, don't, I bear goodwill to all people, including all people of religion, but it is hard for me on moral grounds to understand how you can make that argument and simultaneously, as happened through to November of this year in my home state, out of all the issues you could pick, out of all the issues you could pick, if you want to pick a moral issue, you could pick Darfur. You could pick low-income children in the United States or low-income children abroad. There was only one issue that they were handing out flyers about in the Catholic churches in Maine that was against gay marriage. That was the issue that they picked. So they have that view on somebody's sexual activities, and, but simultaneously let's keep this other issue involving abused children, let's uh, be as secretive as we possibly can. How can you simultaneously hold those views? Well, some people will assert to you, you'll hear it often, that oh, it has to do with the First Amendment, free expression clause, or First Amendment right. But it doesn't. It does not. Even under the Justice Roberts Court, it's not true, at least for now. We'll find out, you know, next time they get together w what happens. But under the Supreme Court ruling of Prince versus Massachusetts, 1943, it is very clear. There is no right to place children in a situation of ill health or death because of your alleged First Amendment free expression clause right. So that right does not exist. All of this that I've described to you is connected to people making decisions, people in power making decisions that have nothing to do with a constitutional right. It has to do with politicians who are willing to let themselves uh, succumb to pressure from religious lobbying. That's why we're in this situation. John Witt of the Center for the Study of Church and State at Emory University says that separation of church and state is no longer the law of the land in the United States of America in the 21st century. That is, that is the situation that we are in. And you know, the religious right, it's the religious right, they're good at marketing terms. And the religious right will always say, watch out, watch out for those special rights, usually referring to gay people, but watch out for special rights. Well, you know what I think are special rights? I think elevating one class of people over another class of people on the basis of religion now that's special rights, and that is immoral, it is wrong, and we need to do everything we can to stand up for it, and stand up for what our country really believes in the 21st century. But we, we have a long, long way to go. We have a long way to go. And part of the journey, or the illustration of that journey for me, comes from personal uh, experience. Uh, when I was in high school, I decided I wanted to try it for the high school play. And I'd never tried out for a play before, and I was scared to death, you know, and I sort of memorized the lines and really worked hard. And I got the lead. I got to play the Clarence Darrow part in Hair at the Wind. Everybody remember that? Yeah. And I tell you, if you want to affect your worldview or uh, affect the worldview of a teenager, have them memorize the lines of Clarence Darrow about the Scopes Monkey Trials. That'll, that'll affect how you think about the world for sure. But the interesting thing now, the interesting thing now about the play Inherit the Wind is that it was written in the 1950s, looking back on the 1920s in the Scopes Monkey Trials era. And you can tell, you can tell by the whole tone of the way the play was written that they're thinking, those were the bad old days. We're moving on. We're moving on to the great uplands of separation of church and state and rationalist thinking in America. Good days are ahead. So what, what happened? What happened to our country that, that church power is the way it is and theological power is the way it is? And I want to say that one thing that has changed, one thing that is different, and I want to uh, grant to you that were churches very powerful in the mid-20th century? Of course they were very powerful, I, no doubt about it. But something is different. And I think part of it has to do with the big box churches and the entrepreneurial approach that you have to grant to them uh, regarding the fundamentalist and the evangelical movement where it's more than 
your typical church with the soup kitchen nearby. You literally have multi-million dollar facilities that have with them, and these are all real examples, the fitness center, the ice cream parlor, uh, the huge broadcasting, multi-million dollar broadcasting uh, organization, and the multi-million dollar lobbying effort on behalf of religious viewpoints uh, in the United States. That is different. That is new. And it's really dramatically affected the nature of this republic. It has affected the nature of who we are as a nation. And you have to grant them credit because they've been effective at doing that. You know, if you go, uh, as I'll sometimes do, or sometimes I'm on, uh, right-wing talk radio, and you'll hear them occasionally talk about affirmative action. And affirmative action, that's bad because that's special rights. And we at Secular Coalition for America, we don't take a position on affirmative action, but I got to say uh, individually that, you know, with the century, you know, at least as far as African Americans, with the centuries of slavery and then the denial of civil rights for decades upon decades, that at least there's a good reasonable argument for affirmative action in this country, what, what they would call special rights. But my question is, do we get specially Graham and his multi-million dollar organization, Billy Graham, they just released the Nixon tapes where Billy Graham referred to the synagogues of Satan, uh, where Billy Graham in the 1960s, at the height of the Vietnam War, said that Jesus was brought to bring fire on the earth. That was Billy Graham's yeah, right. Vietnam <laughs> policy. Does he get special rights and does his multi-million dollar organization get special rights in the United States of America today? Yes. Yes, they do. That's the